remember, please remember that when things get rough, you can always leave over there and come here to Sankofa Books and sit down and relax. Because this is the liberation space and the liberation zone. of the now, a statement which Barack Obama lifted from Dr. King and dramatically introduced into our dialogue of the, for the 21st century. I think those words merit a great deal of discussion, the fierce urgency of the now. Charlie Parker in 1941-42, the great musician, the great innovator, entitled one of his compositions, Now is the Time. And that, com that composition became a, a, a landmark composition in 1941-42 which influenced a whole, a whole generation of musicians to move away from swing to what was then called bebop, but it was really the work of Mr. Parker, Thelonious Monk, Max Roach, Miles Davis, Dizzy Gillespie, etc. And that music in 1941, when black people threatened to march on Washington, because of the injustices that they experienced during World War II and the racism that existed in American armed forces and in Washington and in other parts of the country, that when they threatened the Roosevelt family and Eleanor Roosevelt went to New York to try to see if she could neutralize this organized effort that people like Mr. Ellington and Mr. Parker and Mr. Gillespie and Lena Horne and and, 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 and Ella Fisher were deeply immersed in, led by Paul Robeson, Du Bois, A. Philip Randolph, and others. When that happened, when that happened, now is the time became a signature composition because it reflected the urgency of that historical moment. Not only the movement from moving from swing to so-called bebop, but the, a new movement in art in the work of Roma Bearden and in the work of many other artists, a new movement in the work in the world of dance, in the world of Catherine Dunham, and other uh, others who were creating new dance forms in modern dance at the time. And it was a sing a singular moment in which we had we changed our dress styles and our language and our attitudes in that period. The journey from that period through McCarthyism into the 19, into 1958, in which we began to speak to Freedom Now Sweet by Max Roach. And Freedom Plus was, was a journey that was immersed in the critical issue of freedom in Africa, the Caribbean, and other places. Kwame Nkrumah, Jomo Kenyatta, uh, uh, Patrice Lumumba, etc., were meeting in 1948 and 19, I mean 1958 and 1959, and a new music, a new free music on at Coleman, a new music by John Coltrane, etc., emer emerged. A new dialogue, a new discourse emerged at that point in time, and it was critical for us to begin on the pathway towards what, is, what was subsequently called the Civil Rights Movement. New voices like Malcolm and, and, and Dr. King began to speak to that fierce urgency of the now that happened in 1960-61. And of course, in 19, it, it, it culminates in 1968 with the assassination of Dr. King, and one year before that with John Coltrane playing a love supreme 
1967, 68, uh, uh, suggesting that there were new horizons for us to search for as, as a people destined in the world for a new humanity, for a love supreme. And when all of that tragically ended as a result of COINTELPRO and the assassination of so many of our leaders, not only here but in, in Africa and in the Caribbean and other parts of the world, we begin to hear Marvin Gaye asking what's going on. A statement about the moment. So we have moved through the, 21st cent to the 20th century and we have come to the 21st century now to ask the question and raise the question again, what is the, is this fierce urgency of the now? And we ask ourselves inside of that, with the emergence of Barack Obama, what does Barack Obama mean to me at this point in time? However, not simply meditating and reflecting only on Barack Obama, but expanding it, humanizing it, lifting it, into the larger scope of the African world, in the world of people of color, in the transcendental world of poverty, as the world is sharply divided between the haves and the have-nots, as people confront this, tra this crisis that we've been offered by socialism and capitalism in a world today. So that becomes very important for us. The historic moment reflects those who have written about our struggles from before, as far back as Dessalines and Christophe, and as far back as Gabriel Prosser and Nat Turner, etc., as far back as, 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 as uh, in, in the Western Hemisphere we're talking about, as far back as, as Harriet Tubman and Sojourner Truth, etc. And we have walked through Margaret Walker, and we have walked through Alice Walker, and we have walked through Toni Morrison, and we have walked with all these, 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 these thinkers and artists, and we come to ourselves here, buck naked, in Sankofa, asking ourselves, who are we? What are we doing in 2008? What has happened with the emergence of this young man called Barack Obama, and this young woman, Michelle Obama, and are they reflective of our presence? Are they reflective of where the world has gone? And are they representative of the future in the 21st century? And do they belong to us? Are they our children? And are we prepared to provide for them the strength, the prayers, the vision, the possibilities that will emerge from a dialogue of this sort? We have three people here today that will speak to us. One of our speakers unfortunately couldn't come. She was sick. And we have Greg Thomas from DC, whom I consider one of the most brilliant young men to come out of DC, who is now teaching at Syracuse, because Howard University wouldn't hire him, but that's good. <laughs> because if they did, they would, they would simply destroy him like they have destroyed Haile Garima and others, so we have to be glad for that, although Syracuse is no bed of roses, but he has come, and he decided that he would fly down and come here, he f came in this afternoon, and he's got to go back tomorrow to teach, to talk with us. He's got a brilliant book called The Sexual Demons of, of, Col of Colonial Power that's here and available, you could read it, I think it's brilliant, and you should really look at it. He's one of us from here, from Southeast, Northeast, wherever it is you make him, but he's from Southeast, and that's what I thought. <laughs> However, we have two elders, the dignified, the dignified Brother Ambrose Lane, who has spent a great deal of time educating us, enlightening us, pushing us forward so that we could understand the nature and character of fascism that has emerged in this country over the last 30, 40 years. And, and, and the impact of this fascism on our consciousness, on our lifestyles, on our vision, on our school systems, on our education, our, 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 our intellectual 
tragedies. And he has insisted and talked about that. He has written, he's a historian, he's one of the most brilliant persons I know. And I listen to him all the time. His wisdom has helped me along to understand the fierce urgency of the now. And from Jamaica, my mentor, Leo Edwards, who continues to help me walk through these landmines, trying to understand the world in which I live, and one who has dedicated his life, his entire life, to the people of the Caribbean, to the people of Africa, to the people of North America, to bring to them wisdom, to bring to them commitment, to bring to them uh, a knowledge base and a clarity that will help us to go forward. Now, these are the three speakers we will have tonight. Now, the terms of reference that we have is what we're going to do. Each person will speak for about 15 minutes in the order that I said, Greg, Ambrose, Leo. And then we will have a dialogue. Now, these are the terms of the dialogue. Since we have a lot of people here, we're going to allow everybody to either make one statement or ask one question. We're not going to fight over ideology, privilege, because some, some people will feel because they know me, I ought to, to you know, <laughs> recognize them every time they put their hands up. We're not going to fight over privilege. Some people will feel because they're going to Howard University, they should have to do whatever they want. But we're not going to have that. But we're going to, we're going to generously <coughs> allow each person, because of the nature of the subject matter, because of what it is we're trying to, 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 to testify and attest to, and look down the road. We want to make it visionary. We want to make it forward-looking, and we want to raise some powerful questions that all of us could walk out of here with, trying to, 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 to find answers to this critical issue, the first urgency of the now. Let me make one statement, if you don't mind, to, to demonstrate what I call the first urgency of the now in other times. This is 1967. 1968 and I'm saying this because these are the kinds of questions these are the kinds of statements that I think should come from us rather than the rhetorical emotional types of statements that we come and this is what was written was said by one of our activists we must recognize that we cannot solve our problem now until there is a radical redistribution of economic and political power. America is deeply racist and its democracy is deeply flawed, both economically and socially. Dr. Martin Luther King had taken the final step to the admission that issues of economic class were more crucial and troublesome and less susceptible to change. We're talking about change in today's dialogue and today's discourse than issues of race. He added that the black revolution is much more than a struggle for the rights of Negroes. It is forcing America to face all its interrelated flaws, racism, poverty, militarism, and materialism. It is expressing evils that are rooted deeply in the whole structure of our society. It reveals systemic rather than superficial flaws and that radical reconstruction of a society itself is the real issue to be faced. For the last 12 years we have been in a reform movement but after Selma and the voting rights bill we moved into a new era which must be an era of revolution. I think we must see the great distinction here between a reform movement and a revolutionary movement. The latter would raise certain basic questions about the whole society. This means a revolution of values and of other things, reaching far beyond the question of race. The whole structure of American life must be changed 
He emphasized, as he publicly stated, we are engaged in a class struggle. He was concerned with the redistribution of economic power as a central requirement. He argued we are dealing with class issues and we are dealing with the problem of the gulf between the haves and the have-nots. Now we've got to be very careful as nationalists, etc., because as soon as the word class is introduced, we all begin to think of communism and Marxism, etc., and we get lost with what he is saying. We, when we hear the race, we have precise definitions about that pain and that hurt and that experience we've had in race, and we cannot, tra it's difficult to transcend it. For me, for all of us. So that in our discussion today, we could see where we could take a statement. Doesn't have to be a statement where we all have to believe in, but at least Martin is looking at something very complex and very serious, and he's moving away from even the things that he might have said earlier in his life. It is not one of these speeches that uh, that we hear on the radio uh, on, and on, on on Martin Luther King's day and and, and uh, all the time, and I consider it very important. Finally. I want to move to George Jackson, who writes this, that I think is very important. George Jackson says, on April the 4th, 1970, for the very obvious, it pains me to dwell on the past. As an individual and as a male of our order, I have only the proud flesh of very recent years to hold up as proof that I did not die in the sick bed in which I lay for so long. I have taken my lesson from the past and attempted to close it off. I have drunk deeply from the cisterns of Gaul, swam against the current in Blood Alley, urban fascist America, experienced the nose rub in shit, Arm myself with a monumental hatred and try to forget and pretend. A standard black male defense mechanism. It has not worked. The really bad moments record themselves so clearly and permanently in my mind. While the brief flashes of gratification are lost immediately. A nightmare overhanging darkly. Quickly, the, the, the last part of that statement, which I think is equally important, and I'll get it in. My recall is nearly perfect. Time has faded nothing. I recall the first kidnap. I lived through the passage, died in the passage, laying in an unmarked grave, shallow graves of the millions who fertilized the American soil with their corpses cotton and corn growing out of my chest until the third and fourth generation, the tenth and the hundredth. My mind ranges back and forth through the uncounted generations and I feel all that they have ever felt, but double. I can't help it. There are too many things to remind me of the 23 and a half hours that I'm in this cell. Not 10 minutes pass without a reminder. It's between I and in between, I am left to speculate on what form the remainder will take. Let us speculate tonight. Let us discuss the pain. Let us just look into the future. Let us look at each other and speak with honesty to each other. And more importantly, this is a night for listening. Listen to what other people are saying. I turn it over to Greg Thomas. Can you hear me? In the back? Cool. Um, so the name of the program is Who Who is Obama to Me? That's the name of the program, right? Okay. I think one way of investigating that question is by asking who are we to Obama, and that will clarify a whole bunch of issues. And that's being clarified to the hilt right about now. Specifically, I think if you pay attention to what's being said about not just Jeremiah Wright, but Jeremiah Wright's blackness, the blackness of his speech, of some of his positions, et cetera, and also what Obama has said about Sean Bell and the vindication of the cop killers of Sean Bell in New York. I think this clarifies completely who we are to
to Obama, at least at this particular point uh, in time. And therefore, that can qualify and clarify the question that, uh, that we're addressing today. So I want to keep both Jeremiah Wright's blackness in the white media as well as Sean Bell like uh, front and center when I think about all this. Uh, a couple of months ago, um, somebody called me and they were interested in doing a symposium in Florida. So they were calling me and asked me if I would participate. Uh, I didn't really want to do it. We prolonged the conversations. Uh, but I gave uh, this person my contact information so we could continue the conversation. Uh, and as soon as I did that, I got added to all these listservs that on the internet. They sent me all these messages about Obama and Hillary. So I had to call this person back and be like, please don't send me any of this shit anymore. <laughs> because basically I was never impressed by this whole whack show. Um, and I really have given it no play like whatsoever. Um, but what I found to be interesting is that others have. And, and others who would normally be considered unlikely suspects uh, to fall in certain traps. So all of a sudden you see a bunch of people on not just the Obama bandwagon, but the U.S. political system bandwagon and ultimately the bandwagon of liberalism. Uh, all of a sudden, it's supposed to allow us some new kind of salvation. So people who were, before this campaign, identified, self-identified as radicals, people who called themselves socialists, people who called themselves black nationalists, grassroots activists, Rastafarians, Pan-Africanists, the literati, everybody, all of a sudden became just people who vote D, you know, in the U.S. political system, uh, where you get tricked, and not just tricked, but hopped up on the trignology of liberalism. Like, what is it? about us 500 years deep into this that we can be recolonized so quickly and so thoroughly by nothing but liberalism, okay, whoever the face is at the moment, especially when that very same liberalism just a couple of decades ago was referred to by some as Yankee Doodle fascism, okay. Um, so what's interesting about these conclusions is that it leads some people to think that you can trick yourself out of white supremacy and empire. Right, that you can trick white folk into giving up white supremacy and imperialism just by going into, going into a voting booth, which means there's like a colossal amount of amnesia going on. It's really amazing what can be forgotten instantaneously in the United States or under the United States, right? Um, you can have this rena renewed faith in voting after eight years of Bush, who was never elected, right? You know, for a second, you know, a lot of people use the term the selection of Bush, the reselection of Bush. You talked about Florida, even if you forgot the other states where there was all this massive and crude disenfranchisement of black folk, um, you know, et cetera. Now, all of that has been imported to Mexico, but we'll come back to that. Um, and yet, uh, we can forget all of that and then basically say everything boils down to whether or not uh, black people vote for these candidates in this particular system who are presented to us. Uh, so there's this, it, we end up voting for amnesia itself. You know, we end up voting for the myth of democracy. And I like to quote James Boggs here when he says that the political system of democracy has ex oppressed and exploited more people in the history of the modern world than any other political system, right, that uh, exists. Um, so we vote for the establishment. It's, it's so-called two-party system. And we vote for the idea that you can put a brown face on the establishment and everything will be all right. You can put a brown face on fascism, on colonialism and imperialism. You can put a brown face on state terrorism, since that's the, the, the word of note. You know, I mean, that's the sound bite that's being echoed uh, repeatedly now when it comes to Obama's most recent distancing from himself from uh, Jeremiah Wright, the fact that he called um, the U.S. state a, a terrorist state that is uh, advancing terrorism all around the globe. That's what has to be uh, separated from. But no matter who we're talking about, if you vote a brown face or any other kind of face or any other set of genitalia right, into the office of president, uh, what is that supposed to change itself? So does that mean that the next day or by inauguration that there's no more military economic police block, that there's no more capitalism, that there's no more poverty, whether it's domestic or global, uh, that there's no more imperial invasion, that Iran can sit tight, <laughs> you know, or whoever else? Uh, what is that exactly you know, supposed to mean except to signify uh, a, a, a kind of radical and disturbing syndrome of naivete that we should not have, like at this particular point in particular. So what is all this rhetoric of, of hope and change for? I think it's interesting to go back uh, to Clinton because the same people who are voting for amnesia and the system, uh, in this case with Obama, uh, were quite supportive like of the other part of the Clinton machine, you know, not too long ago. Right, um, so people are fond of quoting Toni Morrison and the statement on Bill Clinton, which I think now constitutes a great historical embarrassment for her, whether she realizes it or not. You know, like why write all that work from the bluest eye to beloved and beyond, and then go down in history for calling this 
fool, <laughs> you know, like a black man. Um, what's interesting, <laughs> what's interesting to me is uh, the work that Elaine Brown did in this incredible book called The Condemnation of Little B, New Age Racism in America. One of many things that she reminds us in this kind of reality check expose is that Clinton, in so many respects for black people, was worse than both Reagan and Bush combined. That more black people were taken into prison uh, under Clinton than under Reagan and Bush one combined. Um, that Clinton executed the so-called conservative uh, contract on America, or whatever it was called, uh, not the so-called Republicans, and there's supposed to be a difference. And also she tracks a really racist rhetorical duplicity, she says, that is not only just uh, a basic part of so-called America, but also uh, is a real genuine strategy of Clinton and his sort of like William uh, Jeffersonian guys. And so by the time that we get to the other Clinton, Hillary, and Obama running, most status quo commentators will tell you that there's really no difference in terms of their politics and policies for the most part, right? This is important when the establishment would tell you there's really, like, no difference. Um, and given what, for instance, gets exposed by Elaine Brown uh, about the first Clinton, right, it's interesting that Hillary Clinton continues that Obama's no different from it, right, and now we're supposed to move from being bamboozled about Bill Clinton to being bamboozled about both Hillary and Obama at the same time. Uh, my last reference to that particular book, which I believe is here and everyone should have, I think, um, is that Elaine Brown comes with these new categories that we can't do without. She does something very, very slick and sophisticated with this notion of new age racism that comes from Clinton itself, that I feel your pain like racism. Like, it's all your fault, but I feel <laughs> like your pain. Um, and she comes up with these new categories to show how people are playing old games. And, of course, she retreats to Malcolm X, right, for that particular insight. So she talks about these new age masses, these new age Miss Anns, these new age house Negroes, these new age nigger drivers, and these new age negresses at the same time. And so how do we apply that specifically uh, to Obama then, who, like Clinton, Clinton, Clinton won, right, we've learned to refer to Bush one and Bush two. Now we've got to refer to Clinton one uh, and Clinton two with Hillary. But uh, Obama exploits blackness black people, um, blackness as well. And I think it was interesting flying down here to uh, see Fox News on the JetBlue TV cameras uh, where even Bill O'Reilly can see this. You know, as some people say even Stevie Wonder can see. Well, even Bill O'Reilly can see <laughs> this. Because <clears throat> he was saying that he didn't mind, you know, Obama's past affiliations with uh, Jeremiah Wright. You know, in fact, he admired his loyalty up to a point. Because he just used that to, to get where he needed to get in Chicago. I think we need to have that kind of clarity, right? So, um, so for career and political mobility, uh, Obama has right used the black church, right? Despite his Hussein conversion, which he's still going to pay for. You can't have the middle name Hussein and not pay for it here. Um, he has used black rhetorical styles, right? Uh, black rhetorical speeches. Although, like when you see the way he has been forced to not just distance himself from, but to denounce not just Jeremiah Wright, but Jeremiah Wright's blackness, right? His black positions, his black speech, his black politics. I mean, how much of King? He couldn't quote most of what Ackland read, you know, like from King, for instance, anymore. Um, he has uh, 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 used the uh, black electorate, of course. He's used his black wife quite a bit you know, uh, to this particular effect. A lot of black folk who don't like Obama like Michelle, <laughs> you know, uh, and he's used her to bring out people and mobilize in this particular campaign. And then more recently, he decided he would use Jay-Z and Jay-Z's version of hip hop when he needed to retort <laughs> Hillary and brush off his shoulder even. But he uses all of these things, but then what does he do? And what does he do when the question becomes Sean Bell or when the question becomes black people talking out loud, you know, real black? You know, like there are no black codes, like to prevent us from saying what we want to say. Then he distances himself from all of the above. Uh, in this sense, he's actually very different from, if not uh, much worse than, your standard accommodationist ambulance chasing, you know, cash cows like Jesse Jackson and, and Al Sharpton, um, because they still function as quote unquote black politicians. Obama does not function as a black politician, right? And this is very, very, very important. Obama has access to the idea, the mythical idea, of being an American in a way that black politicians do not. Because as a, as a politician who would be black or would be Negro, in order to succeed in the US political system, you have to put that political system in front like of everything else. You can't put blackness at the top of your agenda, black liberation of black people at the top of your agenda. You have to protect the state, right, and the ruling interests that actually control the state. Right? And that's what will make you an American. 
That's what will make you an American politician and one who is successful. And that's what that's the prize, right, that he has his eyes, right, upon. Uh, and so no matter how bad Jesse and Al are, right, they don't even have access to that. They're unambiguously black, not just physically, but also uh, even if it's in horrible liberal terms, right, they have a black, like, ideology. Um, and so by the time we get to Sean Bell, like, I don't know if you follow this or not, but uh, uh, Obama had a gas station photo op, right, the day after the verdict and some reporter, you know, oil and everything, um, uh, some reporter asked him what he thought about the, ver the verdict, and he just came out with the rhetoric of don't riot. Don't riot. You know, he didn't say anything else. Well, what should we do instead? According to you, just don't riot. In other words, he tells us to have faith in the system. He thinks something might be amiss there, he said, right? But in any case, don't riot. So we're supposed to continue to have faith in a system that murders us and always finds our homicide justifiable. We're supposed to just wait until it happens again and continue to die and just keep voting for him and people like him in the process. Um, so what we see at play here is an Americanism that Malcolm X exposed as an ideology, right? Because that's the buzzword that's always being thrown around. You're supposed to show your loyalty to uh, America. And this is supposed to apply, I suppose, to everyone, black people, you know, uh, as well as Native Americans, if um, that's even like a viable concept in the U.S. media when you promote Americanism. But nevertheless... Um, most of what we see has already been exposed, unpacked, analyzed, and answered, like in Message to the Grassroots alone, like if you read nothing else or listen to nothing else, right, by Malcolm X. All of this has been explained, like what America really means, you know, why black people catch hell, what's up with the civil rights establishment, like et cetera. Um, what gets added to this particular equation with Obama these days, you can investigate it further when it comes to uh, his uh, previous local politics uh, in Chicago, is there really is like a new mulatto methodology being used here now, right, that you cannot avoid. And when I say a mulatto methodology, I'm not talking about blood quotients because we can all be, <laughs> we can all be, um, what would be signified by that. But instead, I'm talking about a practice and a political practice, right? We need to know that you can be black as sin is supposed to be black, right? And still be and operate in a white racist fashion. In this particular case, this rhetoric is clearly there. So in response to um, Jeremiah Wright, his opening lines were, it's always been my life's mission to bring people together. So his life's mission is not justice, like liberation, but just bringing people together. Well, slavery brings us together, and so does the slave trade. <laughs> You know, like, et cetera, right? So why is that the ultimate thing at the top of your agenda? Um, and he suggests that he has, like, a special mission to do so, right? And so, therefore, the media also is coming forward with more and more information about his white mother, right, that is supposed to make him different. And this is what does, like, make him different uh, in terms of his possibilities in the U.S. political system. The, the Jesse Jacksons and the Al Sharptons, no matter how horrible, and I find them abhorrent, right, um, don't have white mothers, and therefore their loyalty is gone as far as they're concerned, right? Um, so Obama is seen as redeemable by the system to the extent that he's not supposed to be politically black, and what he's doing is playing that, right? Playing black people for as much as he can play them, right, down to his wife, uh, and playing white people for as much as he can play them, you know? And this is like a new, like, in articulation of a kind of um, mulatto methodology that's not even just local, it's very global, because when you listen to what he says, if you're familiar, for instance, with like a writer in Mexico named Jose Vasconcelos, Right? He came up with this notion of the cosmic race. So in other words, uh, the mestizo in that context was special. Mm -hmm. right? That by virtue of having European or white blood, African or black blood, Indian or what have you, and all this stuff, they were basically better than everyone else and had something to contribute like, to the world, even as they occupied a very distinct place in a hierarchy that was above all Africans and above like all indigenous peoples, that they were supposed to have something special to offer the world, really in their dialogue with their own. Uh, white masters, right? Uh, and so that's why we get a rhetoric of togetherness rather than a rhetoric of liberation, right? A rhetoric of Americanism, right? Imperial, colonial, racist, you know, fascist Americanism rather than a rhetoric of black solidarity, you know, despite the uses of blackness, despite the references to Kenya, like, et cetera. Uh, this is what's supposed um, to go down. Um, and so now he's in trouble because he's been playing both sides of slavery and neo-slavery, and it just isn't working out you know, for him. Um, and what's interesting, what was most interesting to me about um, the condemnations of Jeremiah Wright, which are not about Jeremiah Wright, for me especially, right, because I'm not really lining up behind any Christian preachers, uh, no matter what they have to say. Um, I mean, that's not going to be the extent of my politics, right? Um, but uh, what's interesting is that 
in terms of Obama, in terms of the U.S. corporate media. The question is never whether or not what this man says is true or untrue. It's never an epistemological question, right? It's whether or not you should say it, whether or not it should be said. What the fuck are you doing saying this sort of thing out loud, like, et cetera? Again, back to the black codes. Um, and so this is very interesting, right? Because then the law becomes thou shalt not offend white people. This is what Obama says. Thou shalt not outrage like black people. Now, what will come from that? What will come from a presidency of that? What will come from the politics of that? We need to come together. We need to reconcile, but we cannot offend white people. We cannot outrage white people. And if the truth offends and outrages white people, then damn the truth, you know, like et cetera. So this is what um, we're basically dealing with. The other thing that I don't hear the Obama maniacs talking about is, like, what a travesty this, uh, this uh, any quote-unquote success of this campaign would be globally, like for black people, given the fact that we are working against so much uh, propaganda already, to add to that propaganda, like a brown face of the United States of imperialism, like what, what would the rest of the world people think of us at that particular point? Already, we go to Venezuela and we're running into people who are asking us about Condoleezza Oreo Rice, you know? Uh, you know, and, and, and we have to be sure that people understand that Colin Powell right, and Condoleezza Rice do not live in Southeast, have no relationship to people who live in Southeast or any Southeast or Bluffs or what have you, right, that exist in any part like of North America. How much more damage does it do to put a brown face, right, on the face of U.S. fascism and imperialism? How much harder does it make it for us to organize and act and move for communities of self-determination both locally um, and globally, right? The last thing I would uh, want to say here is that we need to also be clear about like what a presidency means. Right, the fact that you have Bush two as president like, for two years really means that you, we need to understand that the office that the office of president the president is uh, a figurehead like position at this particular point. It's every bit as much as a figurehead, uh, just about as uh, the monarchy, you know, like in Britain. Right, that what rules like the state are these conglomerate political conglomerate political like economic um, powers, and not just like th I mean clearly we know now. You can be president and read books upside down. You can be president and never have a job <laughs> before you're 40. You can be president. I mean, we already knew with Reagan that you can just be a B actor and go from the California. And you, Dennis Schwarzenegger, right? You can go from B movies in California, right, to presidency, and then Schwarzenegger's behind him. And now you hit Bush too. Like I don't know if you saw, um, there was an excerpt released from Reagan's memoir recently uh, where he recalled someone coming to him, Bush one, coming to him in the White House and asking him to find for a job, find a job for George W., right, Bush two, and he like, he, he, he regretted this. He goes, what am I supposed to do? He goes, he's not the political one in Florida, but the ne'er-do-well who's never had a job and he's 40 years old. Well, maybe you can give him a job at the New Republic, you know, writing editorials. That should be easy enough, right? You know, so then he becomes, what, two names later, he's president uh, behind Reagan. So, you know, there's, these are like CIA-approved cabals that are making figurehead positions here for the presidency while real power is being executed in terms of political economy and not just like those particular offices. So the very same historical momentum that will bring you to have this blockhead as a figurehead president is what will give you hope by giving you like a brown fascist, right, as a candidate, like as well. It's, that would happen at this particular moment in time, only after Bush two being president and then being somehow legitimized with, thanks to all the amnesia. Could you imagine then having either Hillary or imagine, or emphasis on imagine, having Hillary or, uh, or Obama, like as the president of the United States um, of empire? So the last thing, for real, for real, that I would say. I wanted to, I almost talked only about this. There's an essay I saw, I saw recently that's right there uh, in the Huey P. Newton Reader, uh, where Huey P. Newton is going back to say something about Eldridge Cleaver. Um, and he's talking about Eldridge Cleaver's uh, just, you know, like, Eldridge is a, like a psychosexual monstrosity, you know, and the way he projects his own pathology onto Baldwin via his homophobia, right, and his own uh, uh, super masculine, you know, pseudo anxieties and whatnot. And so, uh, and so Huey goes left. It says this is garbage, it says masculinity and femininity, and each of us, Huey writes elsewhere that humankind begins as female, right, and then comes along, like with males, in an essay called Eve, the mother of all kind, that doesn't take you to the Garden of Eden, but takes you back to Africa. Um, and in this particular case, he said, you know, ultimately that, that, that Eldridge Cleaver is no James Baldwin, but more importantly, he does so by looking at something Eldridge wrote, uh, where Eldridge, wrote, Eldridge said that he making an equivalence. He said that, that homosexuality, which is a European concept, like heterosexuality, the words aren't used until the 19th century in Europe, right? And we're never, ever a part of either one, right? Um, but, 
Nevertheless, he says that uh, Eldridge uh, equates homosexuality, baby rape, and wanting to be president of General Motors, right, as sickness, right? And so what Huey's position is, how dare you say that anyone's sexual identity outside of the value box of the establishment is as sick as a baby raper or the president of General Motors? And so what was constant between them is that they both thought that nothing could be too much more sick than wanting to be the president of General Motors. And today, <laughs> there are so many of us who are lining up and jumping up and down behind someone who betrays us every second of the day for wanting to be president of something far more sicker than General Motors, and that's the U U.S., period. I don't know if I want to follow that or not. <laughs> I have a different take. Louder. Yeah. I have a different take. I think this is one of the most brilliant politicians to hit the American stage in a long time. And I decided that I was going to get involved to find out why he was so successful. So my wife and I, my oldest son, and his wife and his oldest son decided to take a look at what he was doing in the state of Maryland. I found that the reason the Clintons were so upset after Iowa is because they were shocked. This is the most organized political campaign I have seen in 40 years. I mean organized. People ask the question, how in the world did he do that in Iowa? Where almost everybody is white. How did he pull that off? The most fantastic organization I've seen in 40 years. He was doing things that we used to do, Ackland, 40 years ago. And all these people are doing it. While they're in this state, they've got their people in other states and other states. And in those states, they're going door to door. I don't know how he recruited all of these young whites, but all these young whites were going door to door, knocking on doors, asking people to support him. It scared the hell out of uh, the Clintons. The whole, how he pulled off Iowa, uh, it's a brilliant organizing campaign. Brilliantly organized. And he's done it all across the country. As soon as he did it in Iowa, however, Bill and, and his wife, Clinton, brought race front and center. Why was that done? Because they know this country. And they first did it in a way that they always do it, Bill and Hillary. They juxtapose race against sex. And they raise the issue in New Hampshire of race and sex. And they said to the women in New Hampshire, uh, you can't do this. You've got to make sure that this fella, we don't know who he is, cannot pull it off twice in a row. And they were extremely successful. And race has been on the, agen on the front of the agenda of this campaign ever since. Everywhere Bill would go, he'd talk about race. But the key to the whole thing has to do with what we've allowed to happen in this country. In 1996, when Newt Gingrich pulled off the uh, legislation that uh, made it possible 
for us to go from ownership of the major media in this country from 50 corporations to five. That ended anything we wanted to talk about in terms of how the people would ever get hold of everything. And the only thing left for them to grab now is the internet. That's the only thing left for the people of this country. And they're trying their best to capture the internet. Once they capture the internet, there is no effective communication because the people have forgotten how to organize. You know, when I tell, used to tell young people acting that uh, in two days I could turn out five to 10,000 people on an issue. Two days. And I was a nobody. But we had organized block clubs in the black community. And when the word went out that we were gonna turn it out, we turned it out. We turned it out. Try that here. Try that in major cities today. We lost the skill of organizing because we were told after Dick King's assassination that we shouldn't do that anymore. And so the corporation world, uh, beginning in 1972, decided to take back power that they had given up during the Great Depression. They'd given it up because uh, a traitor to their class said, we're going to do things differently in this country. And so in 1972, when they saw Richard Milhouse Nixon decided that he was going to uh, do something like EPA, Environmental Protection Administration, they said, that's, that's it. In two years, they'd formed the Big Business Roundtable with all of the 500 corporations contributing the money. And now they own the two houses of prostitution on 16th Street in this, in this city. That's the White House and the Congress. They own it. <laughs> They're occupied by prostitutes, political prostitutes. And on the scene, here comes this brilliant, don't ever underestimate him. I don't know where his heart is. I don't know him. But let me tell you something. They also saw that this was a brilliant young man. And they had to stop him, but they had to do it the right kind of way. And so the first thing they did was organize all of the, all of the black pimps and, and, and prostitutes that were created by the Ronald Reagan administration. If you remember, once Ronald Reagan was elected, he did two things. Uh, once he was selected by his party, he went to Philadelphia, Mississippi, and gave a speech letting them know that what they were about was making certain that all the racists in the South who were Democrats should become racist Republicans. And he talked about states' rights, and he talked about uh, black women. He talked about black men being uh, using the code words that they used at those times. And so what happened was Reagan became the big thrust for racism in this country. He is honored all over this country. Every Republican candidate praised Ronald Reagan. But what did he do? L Miss Lillian Carter said it. He made it comfortable for whites to be racist. He made it comfortable. So into that pot comes this guy. I didn't know who in the world he was, but I watched every move he made. And then I went to make sure that I was seeing what I thought I was seeing. It was the most organized national political campaign I've seen in well over 40 years. Dr. King was assassinated in 1968. Go back and look at what ha has happened to us. It's happened 
I, my opinion, uh, purposefully, Dr. King talked about the counter-revolution that was undergoing, that was, that was just beginning right before he was assassinated. What was the counter-revolution? He said, you know, in effect what happened, Montgomery caught the establishment off guard, like it caught all of us off guard. I was in college at the time. And here were all of these black folks in Montgomery, Alabama, standing together in unity. It sent a message all across this country and all across the world. And here we have um, the people of this country, and especially us, forgetting what happened. But Dr. King knew. He said there's a counter-revolution underway. They had now decided that the, they were going to openly take back control of everything. And they did. Four years after he was assassinated, they had it all. The only piece left was the, was the, uh, the legislation passed by Newt Gingrich in 1996. Now they got it all. And we talk a lot of rhetoric, but I often ask people that do that, are you organizing? Have you organized at all? If, you don't, if, you're, not, if you're not organizing, don't give me a bunch of rhetoric. I don't want to hear it. Because unless you organize, you cannot begin to even think about taking control of our community ourselves. I raise issues about how in the world we have churches that do not have school after school. Because we need our own, what the, the Jews have, which is a Hebrew free loan society. Hebrew free loan. We don't do that anymore. We did that after the, after the Civil War. We were doing that in our churches. We no longer do that anymore. Where there's a pot of money for people who needed to start businesses to go to and get a loan and not have to pay interest on it. They have to pay the loan back, but they don't have to pay interest on that loan. Uh, we talk, but we don't do. And I look at these monstrous churches that we have built, and I ask them, how many of your churches have school after school where you tell the children the terrible thing we've gone through and to give them some hope that we can do something for ourselves? We don't do that. Every time you, every time we go to church, and I, and it's, it's whether you go, whether you're Christian or Muslim, what do you hear? You hear everybody else's history. You don't hear our own history. You ever hear the, hear the so-called history of the Jews? And there's no, you know, I, I just listened to to uh, Brother Knight, and he talked about. Uh, Egypt and how the Jews were, were slaves in Egypt. That's a lie. We know that they were never slaves in Egypt. In fact, all you have to do is track through the Old and New Testament, and every time they were in trouble, they had to go to Egypt to, to get food. They sent Jesus to Egypt. You understand? When they were going to ass assassinate the child, Jesus, in that story, where did they tell them to go? Take the child and go to Egypt. But we continue to take our buildings that we own and the clergy that we pay and allow that kind of history to be spewed out and we have no, no program whatsoever, none whatsoever to teach our young people our own history what this gentleman was talking about. 
None. And so, let me say it again. <laughs> you know, Obama is a brilliant politician. Remember the word, politician. I don't know what's in his soul. But let me tell you something. The reason he is going to be destroyed is because of that legislation passed in 1996 that reduced 50 corporations holding all of our newspapers, our television, our cable, our radios, uh, to five that control it all. That's the reason they see they tested it out with Governor Dean. Governor Dean was screaming over the crowd and they picked it out and they replayed that scream 663 times in the next day. And his campaign was finished. Now, Brother Knight has been repeated, I don't know how many times, but the last count was over 3,000 times they have repeated the same thing with Reverend Knight. Right. With Reverend Wright. Over and over and over again. The same thing, only the snippet that, that uh, serves their interests. And they're going to do the same thing because we don't have an organized effort to say to the Democratic Party, you must repeal that act of 1996. You can't do that unless you're organized. You cannot demand any action on anybody's part unless you're organized and focused. And so we can talk, but are we organizing? If we're not organizing, uh, we're saying to our young people that we don't see a future for you. Now in those 40 years since Dr. King's assassination, the unemployment rate in black communities across this country has exceeded double digits, except for a little window in the last uh, uh, year of the Clinton administration when it dropped down to a 9.7%. And as soon as George Bush took office in three months, it was back up to double digits. If there were 10% unemployment in white communities, you'd have, you'd have uh, total chaos. Total chaos. They wouldn't stand for 10% unemployment. But we, we, we don't even talk about it much. 10% unemployment. And why is that? Because they wanted to make certain that black men did not have jobs. And what did they do? They opened the floodgates to make certain that, that tens of millions of people cross our southern border. And then George Bush met with the, with the head of uh, Mexico and the prime minister of, of, uh, of uh, uh, Canada, and they decided that they were going to start the process to have uh, <laughs> to have a new government for Canada, America, and Mexico. They even discussed the, the, the currency that was going to be used. And they keep lying about it. They're, they're building now, with the Texas leading the way, a superhighway that's going to go all the way through this country to Canada. And uh, our truck drivers know, I, I have a lot of truck driver listeners, they, they drive it all the time. They know what's happening. But the people of this country are not aware of it because they haven't been told of it, except for one television uh, guy who, who, who did it uh, after, after listening to several of my, of my programs and, and going and doing the research that I did. Uh, there's a, there are going to be some substantial, crazy changes in this country. Or something very similar to it. And that means 
your vision of the future should never be restricted, but you must never lose contact with reality. It also means, if you're in academia, that you can never solve a problem if you don't understand the problem. And one of the things that you try to do if you, are, if you teach is to get people to understand that theory without practice is futile, but practice without theory is very often ineffective. <coughs> and the question is how do you married, marry both things? In the real world, when you want to solve problems, it is absolutely essential to understand what is, but you must also have a vision of what ought to be. And a lot of people who even mobilize and organize know what they're against, they have no idea what they are for. And so after you get rid of that which you are against, you don't know what to do. And you just look at the third world and you see that. Now, I want to agree with you, sir, on one thing. When you are getting into battle, the two things you don't do, never underestimate your opponent, but at the same time never overestimate your opponent. Therefore, you have to do a very careful logical and objective analysis of your opponent. When I was a young man and I captained my cricket team, every time I was about to play against another team, I went and watched that team at play. So on the day of play, I knew the strength and weakness of every member on the opposing team. And therefore, I knew how to deal with each and every person individually. Now, my view of Obama has not changed from the time he announced. I was against it. Not because he's not brilliant. He is. He's academically brilliant. But there's a difference between being academically brilliant and having gone through serious experiences of negativity. You can read all the textbooks you want, but this country, as in most countries, politics is gutter politics. And if you don't, haven't been through that, and don't understand it, you're going to end up in shock. Because when you're dragged down into the gutter, you have no idea of how to function. Like many people in this room, if you became homeless tomorrow, you couldn't survive a week. Now, so le let me start out by saying something else. All the books tell us about that between 1940 and now, the scientific discoveries ha have been greater in, per in numbers than in the previous 300 years, and that is true. What they don't tell you that similar developments have occurred in the psychological sciences. And that the game is about mind control. 
and that the techniques of mind control are extremely well developed. And we don't have time to go into details tonight, but let me just simplify it. If you want to control yourself, you have to learn to elevate reason and control emotion. If I want to control you, I have to find a way to get you to minimize reason and to elevate emotion. And for the last 20 years, in a field of psychology called behavior modification, all kinds of experiments have been done, and nobody's supposed to understand this, but, if you, but when you put it all together, the sum substance of it is that if we, if you can get people to accept your definition of success, you can control them. And so this country, when it was locked into a battle with Russia, with the Soviet Union, perfected techniques of mind control. And they adopted a strategy for, at that time, the objective was supremacy. Where supremacy means you have an opponent, a worthy opponent, who you can eventually overcome. That is supremacy. And they adopted the strategy of what is called total warfare. Because when most people think of warfare, they think of military warfare. The strategy of total warfare says you, you have to fight simultaneously on a number of levels. Simultaneously. Military, economic, political, psychological, and information. And to that, we, the current president has added another one, preemptive military strike. Right? I want to tell you one other thing. In 1954, when Africa and the Caribbean was fighting for independence, the British Foreign Office put out a document how to defeat the colonial uprisings. And it was really a document describing for the first time in writing the, the, the strategy of divide and rule. That's all it really was. And what it says is very simple. Number one, flattery. You take your, you flatter your opponents. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> and you go into an organization and you, if, if, if this gentleman is the president, you find out who is the vice president and the treasurer, and you tell them, but damn, y y you brighter than him. How come you not the president? And since most of us have never learned to control our egos, <laughs> God, that's one of the big fundamental problems we have. The overwhelming majority of human beings have never learned to control their egos. It is not difficult to te to, for that to work. Because when I tell you that, you say, damn, Edwards is bright. Because I am the only one who knew how bright I was. And, <laughs> and then here comes somebody who knows how bright I am. he got to be bright. And all of a sudden, I become very bright. Because I tell you that you're bright. Now, you did, nobody in the world knows that you're bright. Now, now if, if you have to go around telling people you're bright, you ain't bright. Because if you're bright, others will know it. And that is why in the third world and in Africa, the saying is, if you have it, you don't have to flaunt it. <laughs> in America, the saying is, if you, if you have it, flaunt it. 
And if you don't have it, flaunt it more. <laughs> Do you understand that? <laughs> now that is reality. All right. So, there are two fundamental definitions of success. The acquisition of money, material things, and status, that's one extreme. The other is service to humanity. Now, if you adopt service to humanity 100%, you ain't going to be able to pay your bills. But if you adopt the acquisition of money, material things, and status 100%, you have just prepared yourself to be a prostitute because you, are on for, you will be for sale to the highest bidder whether you're unemployed, employed, academic, or professional, or, or carpenter. And so we have students telling up me today, Sir, I am prepared to work for anybody who pays me well. And I said, Damn, you are lost. Because the people who can afford to pay you the best are your enemies. And if you are prepared to work for anybody who will pay you well, you are prepared to work for your enemy. All right, now. So let's understand the reality of where we stand today. In 1968, the United Nations did a study which showed that white people around pla planet Earth were 30% of the population of the world. They keep telling us we are a, mi a minority, and we accept that. They predicted in 1968 that by 2000, they will be down to 20%. <coughs> and if current trends continue by 2050, they will be down to 15%. It was at that point that Richard Nixon ordered a study of world population and its impact on American national security. That study was done, was published a few years l later, and said at that time that there were at least 13 countries who had the attributes of becoming world power. They had land mass, they had natural resources, they had human resources, and that the white world could not permit that and that therefore we had to practice population reduction and or control. These documents are available in the archives. They were classified at the time. They are now available in the archives. You can go and read it. And they said that what will happen, since these non-white people have no respect for humanity, they don't respect death. And when we try to control them and send our troops in, to, for every ten we, that, that they kill, we may kill a hundred. But they don't give a damn about that. Therefore, the only way we can control them is to lessen the ratio. That is written in the report. All right. No, no. no. So, so, you know, this, this is serious business that we're talking about. And the recommendations, I don't, need, I don't have time to go into the recommendations of, of the report, were very clear what about what to do. And when Ford became president, Kissinger advised him to approve it. He approved it and it became official U.S. policy. Signed by um, Scowcroft, who was then National Security Advisor. The documents have now been declassified and they are in the National Archives. Out of that, Kissinger developed a policy called Promoting Ethnic Autonomy because the Council on Foreign Relations in 1976 
issued a report entitled Project 1980s. And this project was under the control of Kissinger and Cyrus Vance. And, and the report recommended, listen to these two things, the controlled disintegration of the global economy and the abolition and disintegration of the nation state along ethnic, religious, and cultural lines. And if you read that report, that division of Iraq into three, the map of that is in the report that Iraq was to be divided precisely as it is now divided. Right? This, this, this is not theory now. This is reality. Oh, all right. And so, out of all of this arose a Reagan who said, elect me and I will make you number one again and I'll return America to its rightful owners. And he was not talking about the Indians. <coughs> now, in 2000, in the census of 2000, it turned out that the prediction of the United was 100% accurate. Go and read the figures. And since that, the Bureau of the Census has issued two reports, one about six months ago, saying that given the current trends, the white population will not be down. At, at least, no, I'm talking about America now. That the white population in America, which was scheduled to be down to 54% in 2050, will now be down to 48%. And s eight weeks ago, they modified that and said, no, it's not 48, it's 47. That has caused panic across the world. And all over Europe, that is why the immigration issue is the central issue in every European country. This is not theory. This is reality. The immigration issue has become the number one issue. And the powers of the world and the other people who have been teaching saying you must stop these foreigners from coming in and who are admitted Nazis and fascists, in every election over the past five years, their parties have been gaining significant strength. Within the United States, if you want to understand, what, go to the bookstore tomorrow and buy Patrick J. Buchanan's book entitled State of Emergency, how the Third World Invaded and Captured America. No, I love Pat Buchanan <laughs> because he's the only honest conservative that I know. <laughs> when other people talk in a language that you cannot understand, and it's called, Pat tells it straight. Pat was on TV, right, and said on television, during the Cold War, when we were in contest with the Soviet Union, we had to win the minds and hearts of other people, and so we had to be nice to them, give them all kinds of little goodies. He says, but now that the Cold War is over, it is not necessary to do that. What we now do, we tell them what we want, and if they don't do it, whip them. Pat Buchanan said that on television, and I was so happy when he said it because black people were terribly confused <laughs> about what the Republicans were doing. But when Pat said that, people began to say, oh, Christ, is that he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't know that is what was happening. That is what is happening. So, you see, I don't get into discussions about racism because racism is a vague term which that people can twist and give different meanings. I say that the fundamental problem on planet Earth today 
is the theory and practice of white supremacy. Yes, right. And if we, and that does not mean, I don't want anybody to go and say I'm racist now. <laughs> it, I, this does not mean that every white person subscribes to that point of view. When I came to the United States, and m in my 48 hours, I had an education <laughs> that I had never had in my previous 19 years. Because I had been told that in America, discrimination was not based on skin color. It was based on culture. <laughs> and that if you were cultured and behaved in certain ways, and they showed me a film <laughs> with stepping, fetch it. Oh my God. And they asked the whole class, would you want to be like that? And of course, the class said, no, nobody wants to be like that, step and fetch it. You, you know, most of you may not know who step and fetch it is. Ask uh, somebody, <laughs> right? But then when I arrived in America within 48 hours, and twice a gun was pulled on, on me, and a white woman rescued me in Florida from death by jumping between me and a man who's about to shoot me, because I went in a place that I wasn't supposed to go and didn't know. I didn't know, I just walked in. My first day, and, and the man pulled a gun to shoot me, and this woman jumped b b between me. She was French, a French lady, who, and saved my goddamn life. <laughs> <laughs> I, then I come to Howard, and I experienced the same damn thing one block from Howard University. You understand? I got mo a better, better education in 48 hours than I had gotten in 19 previous years of my life. So I had to face reality. Then the head of the department, you know, at Howard, the, uh, I'm talking about physical ed, asked me, do you play football? Well, I had played football and I thought I was pretty good. And I said to him, yes. He said, well, come out and tell, let me see what you can do. So I put on my pretty shorts <laughs> and my pretty socks and my jersey, maroon and gold jersey. And I am going out there to show him how to trap the ball and, you know. And he says to me, are you ready? And I said, yes. He said, well, come with me. And I go and I see some big brute, 6'4", with helmets and shoulder pads. And I said, what the hell is that? <laughs> and he says, that is football. And I said, my dear fellow, God, you know, I'm, 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 I'm a young man, you know, and, and I have now in college to figure a bright, yeah? And I said, my dear fellow, common sense will t and logic will tell you football means you use your feet. And I talked to the man for 10 minutes. And that te but he was very nice. And at ten, after 10 minutes, he said, you finish? I said, yes. He said, well, let me tell you one thing. You are in America now, and we make the rules. I have never forgotten that. You are in a... And the moral of it, never agree to play a game without first understanding the rules of the game. <laughs> And the fundamental problem of Barack Obama <laughs> that he jumped in to play a game that he does not understand. Now, if you want to make progress in life, you have to move from what is to what ought to be. What is is an is objective fact. What ought to be involved ethical and moral considerations. But this country nowadays doesn't take into account ethical and moral because they have decided that the world must be ruled by corporations. And so we have altered the fundamental system and we now say we are in a post-industrial era and in the post-industrial era, financial speculation is paramount and the physical economy is of no importance. So we're getting famine and all kind of nonsense across the world. But what is being done is being done willfully and purposefully. How could 
they recommend the control disintegration of the economy. People say, but it can't be true. Go and read the book. It is there in volume one. 19 volumes. In volume one, you'll find it. Because China, in the war in Korea, when they threatened to use nuclear weapons against China, Mao Zedong said, I am not scared of your nuclear weapons. If you cross the Yalu, I'm coming at you. And I know that for every 10 I kill, you will kill 100. But when all of you are dead, I will have 5 million left. And with the 5 million, I would inherit the world. No. I was working in a particular job at the time where we were studying that, the Korean War. And I won't go into any detail, but what I know, what was told to the public was total nonsense about what the Chinese did. See? But what the lesson that grew from that, that, that underscored was that you never play to the strength of your enemy. And so we, they sat back and said, Mao Zedong's strength is population. What is our strength? Economy. And if we, can, if we disintegrate the economy of the world, when all the economies will have been destroyed, ours will be the strongest. Still. And if all the other in economies are destroyed, and ours is still strong, not as strong as it should be, but strong, we will dominate the world. And that is what has happened in America. So we, they, we have set out to make corporations rule the world. When people tell you that the plan is, that free trade is working, they mean it. For them, it is working. And let me tell you how it is working. On December the 5th, 2006, the United Nations University, uh, which is in, in Tokyo. Most people don't even know that the United Nations has a university. They employed some Nobel winning economists to do a study. The study was published on the 5th of December 2006 under the heading, the distribution of, of the, the world distribution of household wealth. This is what the study find, finds. The upper, throughout the world, the upper 40% own 94% of the world's wealth. You hear that? The upper 40% owns 94% of the world's wealth. But the upper 1% owns 40%. That means that the lower 60% owns 6%. But the lower 50% owns only 1.1%. Now, can that the world survive in peace? under that system. That is a system of slavery. Now the question therefore for us, we have to decide, are we willing to support a system of slavery or are we abolitionists? Now, I know how that Obama is bright. But he shocked the hell out of me the night he won in Iowa. When in the speech that he was making, he lowered his voice and said on the record, I accept free trade and I support globalization. Now, if you make that speech and, and say, I accept free trade, Right? And I support globe. It means you support the current system. Sure. Now, if he supports the current system, then we don't need another Clarence Thomas. Mm -hmm. 
right? All right. So this is very serious. Now, however, having said that, in every human being, there's good and bad, and there's positive, and uh, you must pick out the positive, <laughs> if you can find it. <laughs> <laughs> right? What has happened in America, and I am talking now as a person, as an outsider of coming into this system. When I came to this country, you had a man who was head of a thing called the Socialist Party, mm -hmm. Norman Thomas. Norman Thomas couldn't win an election because while a number of whites were members of the Socialist Party, genuinely members of the country, their numbers were not big enough to win an election. So the Democratic Party co-opted the programs of Norman Thomas and ran with them. And that stayed that way. And the maximum number by all the data sociological data that I have seen the maximum number of people who define themselves as progressives and liberals at that time was 20 percent of the American population because of Malcolm King Stokely all of them combined combined we were able to move from 20 percent to 30 percent in the 60s. Mm -hmm. Then along came Jesse, who moved us from 30 to 33 percent. But after he got the 33 percent in the second thing, he made the announcement that race is no longer a factor in America. Right. You remember that? And that's when his decline started. Because you cannot deny reality. <laughs> <coughs> Whenever you deny reality, you're going to be in trouble. And we have been stuck at that 33% for a long time. But the movement from 20 to 33 is positive movement. Uh, so when people ask me, has there been progress? The answer is yes. <laughs> but the critical thing is 51. The difference between 35 and 51 is the distance that we still have to go. Now, Obama has come along, and I don't know the gentleman, I've never met him, I don't know what is in his heart, <laughs> but I know that using very good organizational skills, I know that, using very good organizational skills, he has mar managed to put together a coalition that can, that can produce 45% of the vote, not a winning number. Mm -hmm. So what I beg people to do, and to talk, particularly when you talk to young people, because if you expect an outcome with all your heart, and it doesn't occur, you go in one fr frustration, and from frustration down into a depression. And we saw that in the 70s. In the 70s, when, when Martin was killed, people said, oh God, if they can kill Martin, what hope is that? And when hope was lost, people went into drugs, alcohol, religion, <laughs> and <laughs> astrology. <laughs> no, no, it, it's a, it, it is a fact. And my students began to tell me, sir, when Jupiter and Mars are properly al aligned, that is the only time that black people will be saved. <laughs> you understand? Because we did everything we knew how, and it didn't work. Therefore, we need divine intervention. And when you decide that you are going to be saved only by divine intervention, you have a long wait coming. <laughs> All right? So that is where we are at a moment. And I, what has been baffling me, why it is people are shocked that race has become front and center in this race. Because obviously, that is the only thing that they have going for them. And what is going to, and, and Clinton, I mean Hillary, previewed it in a debate when she said in a very smiling way, 
when this election is over, history will have been made. As a matter of fact, it has already been made. Just look at us. Because this is the visual conditioning. If you just, if she, and then she paused. And when you look, there's a white female and a black male. Given the nature of American society, what conclusion are you going to come to? But, but if she wins, McCain will do the same to her. Only the stand will be on the basis of gender. And all he has to do is to make a speech saying, I am a veteran, I was a prisoner of war, and, and, and the security of the United States is at stake. Now, just, I know she's loyal, I know, but look at us. Which of us can better <laughs> protect America? What selection are they going to make? Uh, but why people are surprised that gender and race would enter the campaign, I don't know. But we end up now with the absurdity of a candidate debating a non-candidate. Because the real debate now is between Obama and Wright. That is what, <laughs> according to the press now, the debate is no longer between, b between Obama and Hillary. It is no longer between Democrats and Republicans. It is between Obama and Wright. And Obama, instead of being cool about the thing, makes this fantastic and tells you for the first time I've seen him display this emotion. I was angry. I am angry. What is he angry about? <laughs> He's angry because his chance of winning has been undermined. No. What I am saying is an animal, any animal, including the human being, when they are angry, are dangerous. We therefore live not in a serious time, we live in a dangerous time. Because I am not talking about all white people, but the fact is the overwhelming majority of whites in this society believe that they are God-ordained to rule planet Earth. At the United Nations over the last six months, the biggest fight has been over weapons of mass destruction in space. Years ago, people thought this was madness. The plan now is, and it is written, it's not a secret, we are going to colonize Mars, we're going to build a way station on the moon, we're going to put weapons of mass destruction on the moon, so that if we lose control of planet Earth on Earth, we're going to control it from up there. That is the level of insanity that we have arrived at. But it is not a joke, eh? It is serious. Within the Congress over the last six months, the fight has not been over health care and all. It is trying to stop this administration from bombing Iran and Syria, because we have a president who says he, he will not permit history to say that he came out a loser. And that the plan is, and all these testimonies that you hear from the Joint Chief of Staff are not jokes. They are still planning to drop something, we don't know yet what, on Iran and Syria. So these are very serious times. Now, but what is fu fundamental is that in the National Security Plan of the United States, as published in September 2002, yeah, they say very clearly, our objective is no longer supremacy, it is now dominance. And dominance means there must be no one capable of challenging us. And so the quotation is, we will not permit any nation or group of nations to rise to the level where they can challenge the dominance of the United States and its allies. And that is official policy. So when you are running to become president of the United States, you're running to implement 
that policy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Greg, Ambas uh, Ambrose, and just now, just now, just now, just now, we have a foreman. Thank you very much, Greg, Ambrose, and Leo for your presentations. Thank you very much, Haile Garima, for providing the space and the entire, the entire staff of Sankofa, uh, Sankofa, thank you very much. Outside. Yeah. <laughs> you see, you are, all right. All right, now, this is the format. This is a conversation. And I know people are used to asking questions in this. What we prefer from you in this is a testimony. We want you to say and deal with the question of the fierce urgency of the now and your response to what Barack Obama means to me. We want to know what you say. So we are not going to get bowed down with people trying to ask the details of the speakers, questions from the, their perspective. We can do that after we're finished here. What we want to do in the beginning is for you to make your statements. Don't make them long because we, 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 you know, we have time and we're dealing with time and so on. But make them precise, concise, and make them clear. As clear as our three speakers have been able to present their ideas to us. If you're going a little too long, I will give you a time out on it. Okay? So now it's your turn. It's a conversation and it's not a question and answer period like we're in a classroom. We want to open it up in another kind of way. All right, who wants to hit? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Come up, stand up so we can hear you. Okay, loud. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Gentlemen, gentlemen there. Just on one and yeah. Yes, uh, I just want to loud so we can hear you. <coughs>
Thank you very much. Yes, sir. <coughs> Louder so I can hear you. Brother Oduno. Kind of deaf, yes. Those who teach independent, successful principles, practices of the past are bound to practice self-emancipation. Those who do not teach independent, successful principles, practices of the past are bound to practice self-genocide. There is no culture. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, my, my comment is, Stand up so people can hear you. My comment is, now. in regards to how we feel about Obama personally and, and what have you, it's, I'm sure that we all would agree that up until recently, none of us would have it, um, would, uh, would have believed it would have been possible for a black man to ever be president in our lifetime. Um, I said many of us, many of us would have argued against that. And when I, uh, up until this time, when I've seen little children, black children, brown children, children, children told that they could grow up to become president, I always said that was a lie. And that is no longer true. So because it's possible now, because it is possible now, of something that I thought would never happen in my lifetime has empowered me to believe in the possibilities that now I feel that, you know, everything is on the table now. So my thing for Barack is that he has empowered me to believe in the possibilities yeah, and I feel yeah, more yeah. energized and are more active in the hopes of changing things in my lifetime. That's my comment. Yeah. Thank you. Just a point of comment. Go ahead, Ali. No, excuse me. There's one thing I think we should... Nobody should be an attorney of nobody here. Let's get at something right. Why we are having this thing is to say to ourselves, should we have an alternative mind also? You can go up wherever you want, but the idea is that oftentimes black people are at the end of the end process. Historically, we end up from Africa to here to Brazil. We've been in any movement, we've been in every struggle, we've voted for everybody. We end up losing in the decisive uh, issue of power. So this whole idea of what is what is Obama means to me has nothing to do about you voting for who or something. This is this is about something like creating a life uh, life um, safety valve. So the depression doesn't come saying when we put our, our everything in one thing. We have known the disorientation that sets in. And I think black people should go, whether he wins or not, can they have, you know, can they continue with the idea of struggle? Yeah, yeah. Can they continue with the idea of struggle? So the idea is, can we go beyond Obama? And here especially, it's a space of friends. We want an intellectual discussion of what it means to us and how we should be, should we be lost in the fervor or should we have a life, what is that thing you need in the ocean? Lifeboat. 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 Black people need lifeboats. Out of everything coming out, they've been united with Native Americans. Historically, they've been united with this. They've been united. They, you know, we have nobody to speak for our people every time there's an issue. The United Nations, African countries, independent, or nobody speaks for black people. Black people's interests get lost. At a time we're living now, it's not a new thing, by the way. All our intellectuals in the 1960s, 1970 have predicted our voice now. That's the tragedy. I'm like, every time we open our mouth, it reminds me finally, the pitfalls of nationalism. 21st century is not about Obama. It's the test of black people's contradiction and hypocrisy. Are we going to be for justice for everybody or for us? Are we looking to become like white people and be monsters? And that is also there in the table. And I think, do not spoil the idea of this space is to say what he means to you, one, fine. But are you also going to, uh, you know, with the kind of panel we got here, are we going to also not, I don't want to hear from the Black Power Movement, I'm disillusioned. Every black person has an excuse why they're not active. They have all, whether they were active or not, they use that as a pretext not to be active now. And we are activists, by the way, here. This is our space. This is how we work activism. So I think come in as a friend. Do not come also to teach nobody. 
but your emotion, your fervor, your, you know, personal emotion at a time like this. You know, uh, just one last thing. I'll tell you. Read how they should cut Paul Robson into shreds. Little white punks come and cut the giants of black people. In one clipping, they do. Jeremiah Wright is going the same thing. You have to know who Jeremiah Wright is. You gotta go to Chicago to know who this man is. No one has, no one could come near to this guy's work. When we didn't have no place to go, when we opened our film Sankofa, Jeremiah Wright Church was our newsletter to get the whole Chicago come see Sankofa. He has a powerful voice all the way to Oakland, California. When I asked the audience, who told you to come to our movie? Not the Washington Post, not the so-and-so, Jeremiah Wright kind of preachers. The other thing is, Nat Turner just emerged again from the church. In a church that is colonized by bourgeois black people, and Nat Turner rose and challenged our, our party, our dinner party is disrupt, disrupted by Nat Turner. We're scared of Nat Turner now, although we live bargaining it, you know, you know his, his whole struggle. And so to me, let's use it for what we have. I came running, my wife was sick, her back is messed up, she organized this thing, and our whole idea was, should we, should we sit around and let these people talk, cut our people into shreds, or should we have a space where we say, emotionally, with feelings, what are we about? Are we going to be gullible always for everybody's agenda? And is it we were waiting for black skin? We would become like, this is a serious issue. Were we waiting for black skin, a black president? That's so cheap now in the 21st century. It's so, in a world that is about, may, may vanish. The world may vanish in the way they have destroyed it. In this kind of world, are we worried about the black president? Or I'm, I'm lost here. So the, the floor should be for constructive engagement to have lifeboat in case this world, this Eurocentric white supremacy, built this world as it is now. Do we have a, a lifeboat? And white supremacy, by the way, and he, I mean, Leo, Leo Edward, when he was talking about white supremacy, he was talking also about the virus of white supremacy that is carried now by black people. Yeah, yeah. I don't see no white people at all because I don't live with them. I live with black people and I see the insidious work of white supremacy in the minds of my brothers and sisters. They don't even have to manipulate us, put a gun on us, they have put the idea on us. So now, I'm just saying, let's be respectful for the agony we go through to put together. We, we, you know, we want even you guys to help us pay tickets for people. There's a sister coming that's going to blow your mind from Louisiana, Patterson, Sunny Patterson. Sunny Patterson. If you don't experience her, you have not experienced what is happening in black America. And white folks don't have to know, it's below the radar. radar. When they get shocked on Jeremiah, Jeremiah has been 40 years working. Black people knew him, he was not a stranger. The black bourgeoisie doesn't know him. That's why they're tongue-tied, don't know how to explain the issue. Sorry. All right, highly set the tone. <laughs> More importantly, our three speakers have given us a groundwork. Something to work with. Let's just let's 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 hear some of the you know some of your statements. Yes, sir. Well, you may not be able to see her because of the light. The light. The light. Yeah. Come ahead. All right. Good evening. My name is Asantua and Prumature. I was at the event at the National Press Club on Monday morning, and I was very inspired by it. I'm also a member of the United Church of Christ. Uh, Christian denomination. But here locally, I'm a member of Plymouth Congregational United Church of Christ, Reverend Graylin Hagley. Let me just say, first of all, the sermon that caused the controversy, I heard a year after it was made, and I've heard other similar sermons, and I've been inspired by all of them. But particularly to this one sermon, Reverend Wright used the word in that sermon and in his uh, event at the press club on Monday, he used the Z word, and that's Zionism. All right? And I think we need to put everything in a historical perspective and historical context. And I'm old enough to remember being a part of a group that was um, started back in the day called the African Anti-Zionist Front. I'm going to pass this around like I did last week. I need this back. Make sure I get back to my files. Secondly, real quick, I'm going to pass around an article written by Malcolm X, September 17, 1964, called Zionist Logic. He wrote it when he was in, in uh, Egypt at the invitation of Nasser. That's the part that we got in the Malcolm X film. Uh, real quick, um, this is an article about Barack Obama when he calls for missile strikes on Iran. Pass that around. Secondly, uh, there is an African uh, LGBTQ 
analysis of the Obama, Obama phenomenon written by his sister, uh, Dr. Irene Monroe. I'm going to pass that around. And lastly, this is an article by Brother Glenn Ford of Black and That's right. That's, that's, right. that's, that's right. the one. That's the one. That's the one. Oh, right in. Right in. Okay. So, I'm going to pass those around. Love it.
TV off. That is not my source of information. Nor is the internet, because I know how that information can also be manipulated. And if we aren't careful, we will become too dependent upon that for, for our study and for disseminating information only to contribute to the confusion. What are our historical models? Being in our churches, Reverend Lane, communicating in our churches, communicating in our families. We better get to that instead of all this electronic bullshit that we don't own. This, again, is a learning opportunity for our children. Every generation has to rise up and make their contribution. Do what you can to encourage our children to do that. Yes, sir. Loud so we can hear you up okay, here. I, I, I'm proud to be here, especially in front of the panel. All the gentlemen up there, I really respect and listen to you. But Obama, this is Obama, this is Obama phenomenon to me, I think it's going to be a real problem for black folks in this country. I think the whole essence of it is two words that now will make you, and that was black folks are being bamboo and good. Straight up. There's no, there's no difference about it. I think it's very educated. Carla G. Woodson always told us about those Negroes that came from Harvard and what they were about, but we didn't learn the lessons from that. I think it was clear when this campaign first started that race was an issue. What's wrong with us? When the campaign first started and his school kitchen cabinet got together, that boy named Axel Rod was the guy calling all the shots. How many black folks was in the room at that point? And all of the things that was discussed up front, each part of a reality. And that reality will change or make it worse. But we have the power of the now, of the present moment. And so what I'm trying to say is that when we look at the Dr. Martin Luther King, Martin had no experience. We know from the history that he was afraid in the beginning. But he had the power of transformation.
I would agree with you. I think people should work and should, I wouldn't, to me I have no opposition to people to actively work to get them elected. But I also think, given the situation of African leaders and the pitfalls of this color-based uh, you know, phenomenon, we need to prepare also for alternatives. The problem is this, I'll tell you, in about 30, 40, 50 years, white people will change the world. Okay, let me tell you, uh-uh, no, they will change the world to be still in charge. The problem here is we'll always be swimming inside their vision of change. For us, I think what we should do is, I'm saying we should have two lung system. In the way even traditionally, the African-American leadership tells you biologically, for example, I never saw the dichotomy of Malcolm and Martin Luther King because I thought they were too dumb in the way historically Africans in this diaspora have survived. Although white people were divided and some black people were messed up, would go try to do kill one lung when in fact both lungs are very important. So I'm saying my personal thing is this. As a filmmaker, I'm, I'm shocked that black people do not organize a light bulb also. Because I'm doing a film on the Maroons now. The most tragic thing about the Maroons is how many times even Native Americans, not the like Seminole Indians, Creek Indians, how many times they betrayed black people. How the, uh, even now, the, 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 uh, a group just expelled the black Indians out of their organization. In, in Florida, the Seminoles are discussing to expel African-looking black Indians. And I'm telling you, in a world like this, we should always be like the way the Jewish community is, saying, I won't trust you, but I'll give you half my foot in case it works. But all my part is also can go this way. I'm just worried about my people not being pragmatic, very, in, you know, very, like, I'll tell you, the Maroons, why do they fascinate me? They fascinate me because they were tricksters, they were mean, they will be violent when necessary, they will be diplomat when necessary. But they knew how to pick two white people, Spanish and, and, and Anglo-Saxons. Where is those black people now? Who could use this? We could play. If we want to play in that world, we should even be this kind of people. And I'm saying, with Obama, I don't have the faith other people have. Because, one, he is, for me, fabricated by the white power that's structure right. that's yeah. disillusioned. Excuse me, disillusioned and embarrassed by the way uh, Bush had embarrassed them for being incoherent, stupid, mm -hmm. unable to know where the comma is. They mm. want to create now something brilliant. The left side of white America, the biggest financiers of Obama were the former Clintons, movie producers, Thank 20 you. people who write his speech, even the one he made in Philadelphia. Oh, that speech was written by a white man, 26-year-old white man, got on television and said, I worked all night, and he just corrected it the last minute and read it. And I'm saying to you, I'm saying this not to put, I'm just saying, be very careful. Be suspicious, not trusting. Because Africans in this diaspora have no reason to trust nobody, including their own people. In South Africa, the same thing. There's nobody we can trust because our own people are used to selling us all over again. In South Africa, the Mbeki, Mugabe. Mugabe, now what he's done to our people is one thing, with the British. And now, we're like, who's gonna rescue him? The black bourgeoisie gets in trouble, we go a skin base, and we try to support, we lose. As a filmmaker, I'm not a politician, I'm telling you, I would like to make a film like the Maroons because I think black Americans have forgotten how the Maroons as the dismal swamp in Florida survived by connivingly playing two powers when they saw it. And now I think people should be that smart. Okay, Obama, I'll give you my vote, conditionally my vote. But I'm also preparing this horse in case yours doesn't work. This is normal. The Jews are doing it. All everybody's doing it. Why not black people? Why do we put all our eggs in one in one person that we don't even know much about? Because to me it's a serious situation. Go ahead, Joey. Sorry. Anyway, it's, uh, it's, go ahead. Go ahead, John. You used the expression, and I was a total kid on listening to you, but I kept, if I say it wrong, don't worry. Please correct. Don't worry. Okay. Please, you were saying something. We are in the, within the frame of within the breath or within a white people. But aren't we also within the frame of Martin Luther King and all the great leaders who have come before us who have inspired, who, who have made a way? In other words, what I'm trying to say is what Martin Luther King and the people like him, leaders like they've done, what's the change to make a, I'm, I'm talking about an
There was one in the back. I know you can't see because of the light, but there yeah, was one more. Give the back also, but the one in the back. Oh, okay, all right, I've got yeah. two people there. It's the light. You can't I see. Just, I just see the one in the back. Go ahead. Could you talk loud and then stand up and talk so we can hear you? Okay, all right. Go ahead. Go ahead.
Achille Anderson. Achille Anderson has a body of artistic work, sculpture, just around the corner on Sherman Avenue. He, he walked out of Howard in 1968 as a student. He talked here last week in this free safe series that we had. He walked out of here, uh, out of Howard, and decided to go and build schools, uh, nation house, and other things, and work in the community, and go into black churches and paint. Uh, what you stained call glass. windows, etc., etc., stained, et glass. stained yeah. glass, and he's done a whole body of work. His mother died, and said, he said, and his mother said to him, son, please get a piece of paper and a degree. So he went back to Howard two, three years ago to get a bachelor's degree and a master's degree in fine arts. And on Sunday, he presented his work. You must go and see it. If it takes you all the way from Kemetic society, ancient Egypt, all the way to the Congo. Mm -hmm. And it takes you all the way from Chancellor Williams to Sheikh Antif mm -hmm. It takes you all the way from John Coltrane to Charlie Parker mm -hmm. and Duke Ellington. You've got to go and see it. However, Howard University decided that he must come before a committee and write a thesis. And then he must come and defend the thesis as though we are in the same, uh, uh, we're back in Plato, 5th century Greek <coughs> and Aristotle. And they, then, and, and they questioned him on this and form and so on, just as this. Is. And, and he, he, he started stumbling and, and falling on, uh, and so on. He couldn't, you know, because he couldn't let his soul represent. Instead of taking that day with these incredible, you must go and see this work. And making a ritual out of it. And then they said, well, they have to go off and meet for 15, 20 minutes to decide that they will give him a, PhD, give him a, a master's degree or not. As though they, they were courageous enough to say, we are failed, you, this is no good. They don't have that kind of courage. So they know they're going to give it to him, but they have to make the pretense of sitting with their legs crossed. So, so I got up and went off. Education without a soul. So the very reason why he left, he got right at the very end and did the same thing all over again. In the meantime, the rain comes down, and the place gets flooded, and Howard with a school of engineering and architecture, all the old building with all the art and everything is totally flooded, and students have to be pushing the thing. I went off. All right, I want to show you all that we could get trapped in these boxes, these places and these locations. I mean, this is, this is an opportunity for us to do what? To trust in each other. Let us hear what we have to say. Not another, not a, you know, asking them questions and all that. Let us, this is what we have to say. Sister who's back there. Go and see Achilles' work. It's very, very important. It's an extension of this dialogue. Yes, sister. And then we'll close off after that. One minute each. One minute. Yeah. A little louder, sister. So. For me, Obama is a challenge and an opportunity. For young people that go to these different places and they worked for his campaign, I'm not concerned about the vote. I'm concerned with them learning their process. Because I think that, that process, we can, other types of things can be put in there and they can use that process to bring our, push our people forward. I'm watching. Um, I'm watching the organization of his of his people that work for him. There are young black people in there. They are learning process. And I think that for me, that's that's where it is. I I, I can't, you know, Obama. Yeah, but but that that I think is something that he's an opportunity to learn. He's an opportunity to, for me to take young people that got their pants hanging down and no, no vision beyond the blend. <laughs> he gives me the opportunity to talk about, about being a intellectual. It gives me an opportunity to talk to them about being an intellectual that can that can learn things about their people and and bring their people forward. Not like Obama does. But I can use that. I can use it. I can I can mold it in a best interest for our people. For them to see something different. For them to look at themselves and look at look at him and try to formulate something new in between them. So that's Thank you very much. I
I, I should tell you that Achilles thing, no, this is it. We, I got the wrong. I got the wrong. All right, after this is the last person. No, it's okay. Achilles oh, thing, I got the wrong. Just, just, no, just, on, just give me a chance. After this person, that's it. Achilles thing is on Sherman Avenue, right near to the fire station. You see a little building, a uh, building called Harvard University School for uh, Sculpture and Art and so on. Go in there with and I need to get you guys last person over there who's ever in this bag. All I want to say is I just want to know when I'll see a black people who start taking care of myself. Taking care of what? Ourself. Ourself. Well, I'll take care. Everybody else on this planet is what us. Everybody else has gone, became rich, what us. Everybody else has, I mean, we have taken care of everybody. We have made everyone rich. We have made, we have done, we have made, made every race just about rich. What I was trying to say is that something's really loud. The point of what I was trying to say is that something's really wrong with us at the level of our political culture when we continue um, to be abused and bamboozled over and over again, century after century, with the same old strategy. Um, and we find excuses to justify the really, the, just the worst form of bad faith that we live in. So we find all kinds of crazy and irrational like excuses to support people who throw us under buses. Um, I think uh, when we refer, I don't recognize the young people that a couple of people have referred to. Uh, I think we at least have to remember that the base that people are referring to when they refer to the Obama campaign uh, is very, very class specific in a number of ways. Uh, and not just when they refer to the white folks as latte liberals, but also to the, to, to the black people who are supporting uh, that particular ca uh, campaign at the level of phenotype. Um, because when he comes out and makes the statement that he makes about Sean Bell, that he's giving you your answer. Right to what the youth have to learn for him, and why do you need to support him for a presidential campaign before you learn, and when so many of us, besides the youth, have not learned from 500 years of history and get stuck with the same sort of dilemma. The only other thing I would say is that let's be very careful about how we throw around the term black. When people are deploying mulatto strategies, when you already have Clarence Thomas, Condoleezza Rice, uh, Colin Powell, how many, how many people have Colin Powell killed right, in his particular role? Why do we refer to Condoleezza Rice as brilliant when she says that George Bush is the most brilliant person that she knows, mm -hmm. right? So why do we need to have hope in people who operate like Clarence Thomas when they have vendettas, vendettas against us, when we have a whole continent of Africa and a whole African diaspora with people who have dark faces in places of power who operate those agendas like in, some, in ways that are often worse, you know, uh, uh, than, than, than raw and uncut like white figures who are essential to strategies like of white supremacy and we still ask the same questions and engage in the same denials. I think that what black power, black consciousness as movements, concrete historical movements have been about is, is, is being very meticulous about what it means to be black and trying to transvalue that and not classifying people as black and therefore needed by support when they are icons and agents of white supremacy. And so I will want us to be careful about the analysis that we conduct, the rationales that we come up with, and the language like that we use to move forward instead of like keeping us trapped in certain scenarios. Ambrose. I'm only concerned that we do uh, what we have to do, and that is organize ourselves. You have to understand when, uh, when we talk about this being a dangerous period, fascism is about here. Fascism is about here, as far as I, our, how, how this government is going to be run. The last eight, seven, eight years, 
they have taken away rights that were were on the books for a long time, some from the very beginning of this country. And they've done it in such a way that most people don't even understand what's happened. And uh, fascism, which is controlled by corporations uh, of our government. Our corporations can now overrule laws that are passed by legitimate legal uh, bodies. They can uh, overrule a law passed by our Congress, and people don't even understand that. They can overrule laws passed by other nations. Uh, we're we're almost on on the the cusp of uh, of uh, of having open fascism in this country, and and if you think it's very it's been very difficult under a, a, a regime that calls itself a democracy. Uh, Think of how it will be under an openly fascist government. And you have now, uh, in, in my opinion, uh, five members of the Supreme Court of these United States who are open fascist. Uh, they gave the presidency to George W. Bush. You have to understand what, what I'm talking about. And these last two that were put on the court are members of the Federalist Society who be believe that the Constitution should be scrapped and we ought to go back to the Articles of Confederation when there was no, no power in, 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 in government. So when I say I, I'm very concerned about what's happening here, I'm very concerned about us functioning in an openly fascist state. So we've got to take very seriously our responsibility to organize and spread the word to all of the people that we can contact. Let them know what these people are about to do. Because if you don't do it, uh, it'll be late and we'll have to find somewhere else to go. Leos? <clears throat> well, I just want to close by saying I know People like to say that human beings act on the basis of knowledge. The problem with that is not true. The, the overwhelming majority of human beings do not act on the basis of knowledge. They act on the basis of belief. Unless you believe something, you don't act on it. And so my concern is really about not November the 3rd, not Obama the individual, but the concept of moving forward towards freedom. And what will be, what, where will, what will your position be, not on November 3rd, but on November 4th, 5th, 6th, and thereafter. And I know that if you get the feeling that nothing can happen, you could become first dysfunctional and then non-functional. And that is the one thing I know Acklin and this group does not want. The one outcome we don't want is for people to, to become either dysfunctional or non-functional. And therefore what we need to do, because education consists both of learning what to do as well as learning what not to do. And if we can look at this experience that we are going through and see what it is that is positive, but also what it is that is negative so that we don't keep making the same mistakes over and over. Because this is what's so frustrating to, to, to me. And when you keep making the same mistakes over and over again, Learn from this thing what ought not to be done, but learn what works. Take it and move forward so that on November the 5th, instead of falling backward, we fall forward and move. We don't fall at all. We move forward. That is my, my concern. As a Smith, and then we will close out. <coughs> Again, I want to thank everybody for being here, for staying, and for those of you who are not on
or the um, guests like uh, Greg who came from out of state and who are coming from out of state. So if you have not um, given a donation, please uh, do so. And if you want to give more, please do so. <laughs> you know, as well. Thank you again. Okay. Well, next uh, one. Uh, uh, first, I want you to know, uh, let's leave this young guy for a second and talk. These are giants of the community. We know their service, years of service. I was wondering one day when uh, Amroyd Lane is going to be a target. One day, like Jeremiah Wright, when is his day coming? When are white folks going to come? I know I hear on the radio, get on his case here and there. He knows how to handle. Since I've been in Washington, he is a fixture, an educational uh, encyclopedic, uh, uh, not only on politics, on culture, and you have experienced a very, very important community activist here. And then Edward, I mean, this brother here. Something else. You gotta know, it's something else. We need to have, I'll tell you what, I, when I was listening to them, we need to have a, a weekly class, just class, where you enroll. And we just, because we gotta take note on the facts he has, he could offer. One, when I'm sitting in coffee shop talking stuff with my friends here, he is in the Library of Congress getting all this stuff. And I'll tell you, it's not even like Dick Gregory kind of uh, conspiracy thing. These are factual stuff. Not to try to put the brother, because he works on a, com on a different level of what he, 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 how, what he wants to awaken in us. I'm not putting him down, but these are facts. So I'm hoping some of you would help me an idea. As I said here, we got to have class here. And then Greg, uh, sister, my sister, uh, uh, Kibibi. Kibibi, I, have, I have something to say to you. Gotta, you can't go. And this brother here, Gregory, let me tell you, nine, nine kids have died for one brother to rise up out of D.C. If you don't know, I have statistics for you. My film I'm trying to do called Chicken Bone Express is really about people that I grew up in, I mean, I uh, uh, neighborhood in Northeast and minute I saw this brother go to all the way to PhD, I was just shocked how he escaped because Quentin is in prison, Peanut is in prison, Little Man and Big Man are in prison at Oak Hill and then they graduated somewhere. Smithy is in jail. One brother just died. I went to my neighborhood. They told me he died. I'm ending the movie with dead young black men during Reagan. The movie is ending by dead pictures of young black men. Yeah. And for him to rise like when he's coming up, it's impressive. He's our brother, our son. We will shelter him. We'll make sure they don't buy his brilliance. This is how we lose musicians. We lose. I'm a filmmaker. They never bought. But the way you neglect me, I could have shit. I should have sold 20 years ago. <laughs> then you would worship me because I've been Hollywood talking stuff of Ebony and Jet. Anyway. <laughs> The point I'm trying to make is this. One, this part of it, and then in the, in the, in the room we have to, our brother here, could you please stand up? All of you know him. He's always organizing. Get his book right there, The Nile Valley Civilization. He's always organizing. Like his teachers, Essa Hilliard, he will be dying fighting. These are the people we have. And now, Kibibi, the sister you heard there, she is the reparation sister here. She was fighting sometimes alone, sometimes with, you know, how our folks are in and out, in and out, so much, so much uh, schizophrenic situation in our community. Uh, what is the brother, the psychiatrist, uh, uh, Akbar? Naim Akbar? You need to hear Akbar, Naim Akbar. He analyzed all of us so good. He knows he has catalog categorized all of our illnesses, including my uh, uh, UCLA friends who have some secret problems in their obsession with whiteness, he analyzed all of us when we were students, when we graduated, and even when now. Now, the last thing I want to say is something important, I think. Because to, to me, let me tell you, I am with Kibibi. She's always positive, which is very important. And I'm also positive. But what I do is I decided at one point in my life, and this is during Sankofa, I decided that if black people had their heads together, I shouldn't have gone through nine years to find the money. Because I saw them throwing it all the time, and still I see them throwing the money from here to South Africa to Nigeria. Then I said, why torture my family? Why not do pornographic movie and violent movie with desperate black women and black men, and just do the next 
They'll still worship me, they'll forgive me. Black people always forgive, even the ones who sold them, they'll forgive me. Why even worry? And then I thought about, well, but them and me are not the decisive. The decisive is the historical process, black people, barefoot, black, poor black people, nameless, faceless people have set in motion a revolution that you either be with it or be discarded with it by being materialistic, spiritless, and the choice is to join the struggle that has been set in motion. Unlike my sister there, this is what I want to give you to hear, and we're going to go to the coffee shop to argue. <laughs> I think as African ancestral relationship is not automatic. Let's read, let's argue, it's not automatic. Fanon has given it size. It skips. Some generation, you can't help it, they're going to skip. Make sure, I think to me, when we attribute our hope into a generation, we then lose the responsibility of making Sankofa. Your spear. You have to make your spear whether there's a generation to take it or not. But when a generation, 100 years from now, wakes up, have you left a book, a poem, a movie, huh? a deed, a pyramid? That is what's going to be decisive. The rest is peeing, shitting, eating, eating, shitting, peeing again. The cycle is very animalistically. The only thing human beings are judged, even now what we are fighting is the Egyptian pyramid that was robbed. Why? Because it's a concrete something with all its spirit left. And I'm saying, to me, generations, I teach at Howard, hey, hey, if those are the future of black people, 99.9% .9 of them, I should stop and just really be in the reception at the AFI, go to the Jesse's dinner, go everywhere where I'm invited. I don't go to the black bourgeoisie Invitation. Except Acklin is the big, the only bourgeois I know. I go to his <laughs> He's a poor bourgeois. So what I'm saying is, black people, black. Have you gone to the Black Caucus party? Have you been this politicians who are for human rights? Have you seen them on the Black Caucus week? The Shriners. I prefer the Shriners when they come to town than the Black Caucus because you see a beastly class growing out of our bosom. If black people are not ready to deal with this and give it a name, I know if we say class there's phobia, but I'll tell you, if we don't give a name to these black people that are going to betray history, then we will not know what to do before we pass this earth. Because to me, his book, my brother's book, he can die tomorrow. That book is what is going to live, and ten generations can skip. I do not believe in my children, my own children, except when I want to be really possessive, or my kids are the best. I'm just saying, my kids, are you the lost generation? Is it going to be 10 generations skipping? And so I'm saying, this basketing, our life, makes us get off the hook of doing something. Seven of us can make history. Forget the children. If they do, we will see with Obama if they build pyramid. But I'll tell you, <laughs> I think we are out for 10, 15 generations, but have you left the tool and the weapon for the generation that comes to say, did you leave me something? This is how I look at Du Bois' book for me, Garvey's book for me. I always felt they left it for me. When Paul Robeson sings, he sang for me. I even cried because I think he knew I am going to come onto this earth, be born. And so you got to know your responsibility, unless you want to shift it to the generation, is leaving something because you could, we could be facing a failed skipping generation. Why not? That has happened in history. And so this whole idea of ancestor claiming is not logical, it's not mechanical, otherwise you're using materialism, Christ, judo christian doctrine to analyze a very, very African spiritual concept. Because in, in the society I come from, there is a generation that skips. In fact, my father's generation called me the son of ashes. His friends called me, is this Garima's son? He is ashes because my father was amber, flame, fire. And he was a kid born into American dance and American culture. And they said, this guy is ashes, not Garima's son. Because my father fought the Italians, wrote play, fought in the woods. It's something else. I can never be like my father. But I'll tell you, the African-American struggle resurrected me to look at 
given my father. Before that, I only knew Doris Day, John Wayne, like Aglin when he was in Trinidad. turning into ashes and I said I'm going to resign from my generational trend of car women color the criteria of materialism has nothing to do with the spiritual century the black revolution engulfed me this is what I'm grateful about African Americans to be the special life the special place they have in my life is when they res resurrected me in the, bla the black power movement I said wow I am sick this is a movement that cleansed me purified me and that's the only thing I owe black Americans. They're Otherwise, I remain Ethiopian. I will never indulge in some of the crazy tricks African Americans are capable of going. I know when to betray my friends. The ones that I went to school in LA, I know when to leave them. Because there's this allowance to contradiction. We continue to forgive traitors. This is the only community. I don't know what is wrong, and it's not in the maroon history, it's not in the slavery history, it's modern texture. Thomas wouldn't have come if black people were really tough. Yep. He would not do what he's doing there now. That's right. But black people are spineless from his view. We allow him. Nobody even threatens him. Nobody even says, I'm going to get you. How did you get there in the first place? And all the psychological trauma he has, he's making black people pay for it. Last, I would say this. I think the best you do is it doesn't matter which generation. Leave your minds, your thoughts, your footprints of resistance. Resistance. Nothing can. Africans in the diaspora cannot give banks. They can't give me money. I saw it in my own case. I have 20 scripts undone, and I would die having not done them. Okay? But African Americans can give the world the most potent revolutionary idea resistance. The diaspora of black people are tested by the idea of resistance. And if a generation had come to compromise that, I'll tell you. The idea of resistance will be picked up by other people. Even white people, when I said white people, even white people are capable of ab abstracting the struggle, resistance history of black people and take over this country. And so for me, the only thing I would say to you is this. I think leave the best footprint you have if you care for the children, but do not burden them. You know, do not say they will do this. I will not burden my kids. I will only leave my footprints. And it may not be, Mother Mix's kids may not be the ones who carry the baton. It's not Paul Robeson's great descendants who carry the baton. It's Ackland from Trinidad. It is the sister who came out of Northeast who is carrying his, not his direct descendants. It doesn't go like that. You don't like genetically give, you know, resistance. Then you get very superficial. Thank you very, very much. Oh, oh, oh. I spoke all this to say, you have to do the fundraising. We got to donate for the flights. There's a sister coming from South Carolina. This bourgeois, not the bourgeois, poor bourgeois, okay? You might have some relations to his neighbors, but he's paying out of his pocket, and we want to give him back. Please help us. Thank we're you very also, much. We're also, next week, don't forget, we have Sonny Patterson, Laini Mataka, and, and Asa Mutalafa from Baltimore. New York, uh, a, a phenomenal poet, somebody who will leave you breathtaking next week. So please come next week. We'll have three poets and then we'll have our, dis our discussion. Okay.